Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God is always faithful, and God moves in people's life who surrender to Him, who wants to fulfill His purpose. God will move in a mighty way to bring about a fulfillment of promise. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is a very clear one, and that is, are we interested in the promises of God? Is this the passion of our life? And are we willing to act faithfully? And here in the passage we're going to look at this evening, we see a very close relationship between faith and obedience. Now, faith saves, and having been saved, this same faith will manifest itself through obedient acts. And Avraham is going to demonstrate obedience, this man of faith. Well, we're going to look at a very well-known passage, the binding of Yitzchak, Achidat Yitzchak in Hebrew, from the book of Genesis in chapter 22. So with that said, take out your Bible and look there with me. The book of Genesis in chapter 22. Now, as I said, this is a very well-known passage of Scripture. And sometimes it's the familiarity with a passage that causes us to neglect the text, meaning this. We know it so well. We've heard it preached many times. This passage, of course, is foundational in the Rosh Hashanah service. It's something that we encounter in the synagogue every day because the morning service begins with this scripture. So we know it well, and that oftentimes causes us to neglect it. We do not scrutinize it because it's so familiar to us. Well, in this study, we're going to pay close attention to the words and hopefully bring out a new and a refreshing truth from this scripture. Genesis chapter 22, let's begin in verse 1. We read here, And it came about after these things. What things are we talking about? We're talking about Avraham having displayed a commitment to God. And now he has reached a very high spiritual pinnacle in his life where there is one further test for Abraham. And this test is the most difficult. And what we can derive from this history of what we've seen in the past several chapters is that Avraham, he has obeyed God, he has listened to him, he has responded in faith, and now he's ready for this final test of his faith, the pinnacle of one who loves God and who is committed to the promises of God. So it's after these things, all the things that he has passed through Avraham, it says God tested Avraham. And this test is not so much for God's standpoint. God knows all things. But it's to teach Avraham the outcome of obedience, what true faith produces in one's life. So this testing is to grow Avraham even more, to lift him up to a higher spiritual position, so that he has greater revelation, that is, he sees things better from the perspective of God, so that he can accomplish more for the purposes of God. So we read here in this first verse that God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Avraham, and notice how Avraham responded. It says here, and he said, Hineni. Now, once more, this expression is well-known in Judaism, 
Many organizations take their name from this word, Hineni, and it means, behold, I, meaning I am here, I am available, and I'm ready to serve. So Avraham is responding in a way that shows his availability to God. Let me ask you a question. Are you available to whatever God seeks from you? Without any restraint, without any conditions, are you ready to respond to God and to provide him that which is most dear to you? Are you, in other words, willing to demonstrate that God is first in your life? And His Word, His revelation is the foundation of every act that you want to perform. So Avraham says, Hineni, verse 2. God responds and says, Take, please. Now, this word, na, in Hebrew, oftentimes it's a word in modern Hebrew of politeness, so I translated please, but it's also one of beseeching. The rabbis ask, why would God beseech? And the answer is, because God knows the wonderful outcome of Avraham doing this. It reaffirms to Avraham God wants the best for him. So this request that God's making, literally a commandment, well, this is for Avraham's interests. God wants him to do this because the outcome is going to be good for Avraham and the purpose for which Avraham has been called, and that is to mediate blessing to others. So God says, take please your son. Now, Avraham, at this time, we know he has two sons. He has the one from Hagar that we spoke about last week, Yishmael, and he has the child of promise, not the child of, of the flesh, but the child of promise, Yitzchak, from Sarah. So he says, take your son. Well, which one? Well, notice this next phrase, Yechidcha, which means your only one. Now, this is very important because it speaks about how God is recognizing for his purposes, for Avram's calling, only one his son is recognized by God, and this is Yitzchak. Of course, the Quran turns it around and places the emphasis on Yishmael, the child of the flesh. And that is why we know that Islam is a fleshly religion. And we find that the faith of the scripture, the faith of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, the faith of Messiah Yeshua, the faith of the God of Israel is one that is based upon spiritual purposes, not the purpose of the flesh. So God says, take your son, your only son, whom you have loved. Now, it puts it in the past. And the purpose of that is to speak love in its entirety. Avraham has thoroughly loved him, and he has displayed that love. And now we have the word Yitzchak, that son. And then notice you only have it in Hebrew. You have the phrase lech lecha. Now, why is that so important? Well, if you come from a Jewish background and you're familiar with the parshiot, that is the weekly Torah portion, you will know that when Avraham is introduced in the scripture, he is introduced in the Torah portion called Lech Lecha. And the primary thing in that Torah portion, Lech Lecha, is the covenant that God made with Avraham. So this expression, Lech Lecha, repeats itself here in this passage in order to confirm to the reader that what God is commanding Avram to do, it is related to those covenantal purposes. Can I say that another way? Yes, I can. It is related to the covenantal promises of God. We can also see that there is a relationship between commandments and the promises of God. Many people don't like to hear that, but that is biblically true. So God says, 
Go, you go to the land of Moriah. The word Moriah comes from a Hebrew, a couple Hebrew words, which means the Lord is my teacher. Mori comes from the word Morah. The, the E sound means my. So my teacher, and the last phrase, Ya, Moria, has to do with, with God, the Lord God. That phrase, Ya, a, a shorter version of that sacred name of God. So God is going to teach Avraham. That's what this trial is for. So that Avraham learns greater spiritual truth. So you go to the land of Moriah, Moriah, and you offer him up there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains. Now, it does not mean Avraham. You know, go, there's many mountains there. You choose one of them and offer him up there. That is the wrong way. It's a failure to see the definite article. That definite article reveals to us that there is one specific mountain. God says, you go to the land of Moriah, you offer him up there, that is emphatic, you offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will say unto you. So the first thing I want to say about that text is that Abraham, he is dependent upon revelation in order to fulfill God's purpose. And guess what? You are and I am as well. If we are not constantly seeking God's revelation, waiting for God to speak to us, and one of the most common places he speaks to us is in his word. If we are not emphasizing the word of God, if we are not understanding our absolute need, a total necessity of God's word, we're not going to be able to carry out God's purposes. In other words, we will not demonstrate faithfulness. So God says, upon one of the mountains, which I will say unto you, verse 3. Now, Avram knows Yitzchak has to die. A burnt offering, that implies he's going to die. This son, this only son from God's standpoint, whom Avraham loves. Now, when I'm excited to do something, the next day, I will get up early. Go to bed, but wake up early for that, that purpose. But when there's something the next day that, that I don't want to do, well, I won't set an alarm, and I will sleep late. This is not the character of Avraham. Avraham, even though that this would be a painful, not a pleasing thing from a human standpoint, but Avraham rejoices in obeying God. For Avraham, that is a priority of his life. So let me ask you, is obedience to God a priority of your life? If it's not, you're going to find that things just don't go very well for you. You are going to experience frustration. You're going to say, you know, I, I had the worst timing. I, I just don't get a break. Things never go my way. And the reason for that is because you are living according to your way. That is a foolish way. It is not an efficient way. It is not going to be a prosperous way in the things of God. You're not going to have a prosperity of joy and contentment. You are not going to have a prosperity of good works. You are not going to be a recipient of a prosperous revelation from God. So all these things that you're lacking is because you don't have a faithful obedience that characterizes your heart. But Avraham, he did. And how do we know this? We'll look at verse 3. And Avraham rose up early. He got up early in the morning. He, he saddled his, his donkey and he took two young men with him. Now, why two? Well, there are two interpretations of the meaning of that number two in this context. Two can be referring to two as in two witnesses or a confirming. And that's one thing we could say here. 
Also, too, more frequently, if you listen to me frequently, you'll see that I say two speaks of two different, two conflicting opinions. And, and that's also going to be relevant because Yitzchak and his father, they're not going to see things uh, initially the same way. And we know we have God's opinion and we're going to have a earthly opinion. What do I mean about that? That'll become more obvious in a few minutes. So he takes these two young men with him and also Yitzchak, his son, and he splits the wood for the burnt offering and he gets up and he goes to Ha-Makom. Now, that means the place. But that term, Ha-Makom, also can be used as a term for the omnipresent God, that God is everywhere. And what's being revealed here is this, that, that as Avraham, Yitzchak, and these two young men go to this place, they're going to experience God. God in a unique way, in a way of revelation, is going to be seen in that place. God is going to be experienced in that place. And that's the same truth for us. When we are excited, when we are committed and enthused to serve God, even doing those things that naturally go against us, our natural inclination, the desires of our own self, rooted in our own personality, our own flesh, when we go against that in obedience to God, and we're excited about that, God's going to be manifested in our situation. When we walk in the flesh, God's going to be distant. He is not going to be omnipresent in our situation. So we read in this passage that he split the wood, he got up, he went to the place which he had said to him that God had said to him. So as he's moving, God is providing revelation. And that's also a very important principle. Every time I obey God, every time I move in obedience, when I put his truth into action, that activity is going to bring about greater revelation. God's going to speak. God's going to derive, uh, uh, direct me. He's going to arrange things in my life. So obedience brings about efficiency for the believer efficiency in carrying out the purpose of god well look if you would to verse four it came about it says here beyom hashlishi on the third day the number three for the purpose of revealing something but the number three also is uniquely related to victory why well messiah rose from the dead on the third day showing victory and this day is also going to be a day of victory because the outcome of what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes is life, a victorious life, life that conquers death, life that fulfills the will of God. And that's what victory truly is. So all of this comes about, what does the scripture say? Look at verse 4, on the third day. He gets to that place and we read, and Avraham lifted up his eyes. I hope you know that that is a Hebrew idiom for pray, for praying. He prayed. And when he did so, God showed him the place from a distance. So he wasn't there. But because he prayed, that is, because he sought God's guidance, God's revelation. And he sought it through prayer. God showed him that place, but still at a distance. So God provides the needed revelation in order that we can get to where we need to be. And we're going to find one of the emphasis of this text is this location and what God does precisely in this location. We're going to learn as well, this location is a place of worship. Why do I say that? Well, look, if you would, to verse 5. And Avraham said to the young men his young men sit you sit here with the donkey and i and the lad that is yitzchak we will go unto thus that we're going to go to that place and what are we going to do we're going to worship 
and we're going to return unto you. Now, this is a statement of faith. Why is it a statement of faith? Well, God said you're going to offer him as a burnt offering. That means Yitzchak, and we said this, has to die. But, but God is a God of life. Death is not the end. When you look at the book of Hebrews, and we're studying the book of Hebrews in our weekly television show, also uh, seen on many of our internet platforms. And we know when we get to chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, it speaks about how Avraham had faith. He offered up Yitzchak because of that faith. And he believed that God would raise him from the dead. Yes, he thought Yitzchak was going to die, but that's not the end. God's purposes are always completed by means of resurrection. And what do I mean God's purposes are always completed by means of resurrection? Ultimately, the purpose of God, everything that he commands us to do, it's related to the kingdom. And kingdom entrance demands resurrection. So Abraham had faith in resurrection. So he said, we're going to worship and we are going to return unto you. Verse verse. Six, And Avram took the wood of the burnt offering and he placed it upon Yitzchak, his son, over and over, his son, his son, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the, the knife and they went, the two of them, they went together. Now, two of them, this is showing what? Well, it is going to show how God brings about how he brings about his purposes. They're going together. That is unity. And when we, both people, walk in regard to the purposes of God in obedience to his will, the outcome is going to be unity. When you do your will and I do my will, it's going to bring about conflict. What does James says? Where do wars and battles and conflicts come from? Very simply, when people do their will. The outcome of always people doing what they want, what they think is right, is going to be conflict. So here we have unity. Verse 7. And Yitzhak said to Avraham, his father, and he said, my father, and notice how Avraham responded. He says, this is the second time, Hineni, behold, here am I, my son. He's available. He is with his son. And in the same way that God provided revelation to him, he is going to provide revelation to his son. Yitzchak says, uh, Behold, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, Yitzchak is old enough that he understands that they're going to worship. He sees the fire, the wood, the knife to slaughter. He says, but I don't see, and what's important is the Hebrew word say. This word say is lamb, but not just any lamb. We could use the term kevis, but we don't because this word is usually related to the Passover lamb. So in this, we're seeing, and Passover is related to redemption. We're seeing principles of redemption taught, and God's plan for the kingdom is a redemptive plan. So here in this passage, we learn about redemption. So Yitzhak says, you know, I see everything that we need except for the lamb. And where is that lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8. And Avraham, he said, God. And literally, your Bible may say provide. It's the word yere lo. God will see of himself. Now, if you translate it provide, that's more of an idiom. The idea here is because God has seen, he looks He will provide what is lacking. But the emphasis here is on the word lo, which means of himself or for himself. So God is going to look, look at this situation and provide of himself what is required for what? Well, the answer is going to be for life. For whose life? Yitzchak. Not to die, but Yitzchak is is symbolizing the seed of Abraham, which is Israel. So this is going to reveal to us 
a principle whereby Israel, meaning the people of God, can find life. Now, there's also going to be a relationship between what is provided and the, the Messiah. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So Avram says, God will see of himself the lamb. He's going to see that it's not there and he'll provide, that's why people say this, for the burnt offering, my son. And once again, having heard this, the two of them walk together, unity. Yitzchak heard his father's response and he submitted to it, unity. Verse, verse 9. And they went to, this is the third time it's mentioned, Hamakom, the place. What should that tell us? God's going to be manifested in this place. God, it says here, and they went to the place which God had said to him, meaning said to Abraham. And what did Avram do? Middle of verse 9. Avram built there the altar, and he arranged the wood, and he bound Yitzchak, his son, and he placed him upon the altar above the wood. So everything is arranged now for the sacrifice. Something that I find very interesting is that Yitzchak doesn't speak. He is silent. He is submitting totally to his father. And this is a message to us. We need to as well understand how important submissiveness is. Yitzchak trusted his father and what his father said to him. And he obeyed. So let me ask you a question. Do you trust what your heavenly father says to you? And are you willing to obey it even though with your own physical eyes, it looks like things are coming to an end for you? Well, verse Verse 10, Avraham, he stretched out his hands and he took the machelet, the, the sword or the knife to, and here's a word, to slaughter his son. And this word that I translated slaughter, it is a word that usually is not a slaughter like an army slaughtering people, but having to do with a ritualistic killing one that is usually related to a shochet, and by the way, it's the same word in a different form. A shochet is a butcher, but one who has ordination from, from God for slaying that animal for a sacred purpose. And that sacred purpose has to do with worship. And that's why when we eat, we wash our hands ceremonially, to show that we eat not out of a physical necessity, but we eat out of a spiritual need in order that we might bless God, serve God, worship God. So all these things are being revealed. Verse 11, everything's ready. Avraham's hands up with the knife, about ready to slay his son. And verse 11, and the angel of the Lord, not just any angel, but the angel of the Lord, and usually when this term Malach Hashem appears, it has to do with a context of salvation. You do a good study of this phrase, Malach Hashem, and you'll see it in victorious times. Things that speak to a kingdom victory. So, shouldn't surprise us. And the angel of God called from the heavens and it said, Avram, Avraham. And he said, here am I, that same phrase, this is the third time. Hineni. Avraham's always, no matter what, he's available to God. The question that many of the rabbis ask is, why does the angel say, Avraham, Avraham? And many times when things are repeated in this way, of course, emphasis is one of the things we should look towards if there's an emphasis there of emphasis. But oftentimes when things are repeated, like the word me'od, me'od, very, very, Many times we just translate it exceedingly. But that term, meod, meod, very, very, has to do with this age and the age to come. And in that same way, what is being revealed here by two times the name of Abraham being stated is that this has earthly implications and it also has kingdom ex ex implications to it. So the angel says, Avram, Avram, and Avram says, here am I available. 
And he says, do not stretch forth your hand to this young man and do not do to him anything for now. Now, this is going to speak to God and God's going to make a statement. Now I know. You mean to tell me God didn't know this, this this omnipresent and omniscient God? Of course he knew this. But there's certain things that God wants to experience physically, meaning literally. Not just a statement of obedience, but God wants to experience the actual act of obedience. Because what it's telling us is, it's not just enough to say, I love God. But we need to demonstrate that God wants to experience that obedience. And he sees that in Avraham's life. And what happens? He says, now I have known. It's in the past. He says, now I have known that you fear God, that you do not withhold, that you did not withhold your son, your only one, your only son from me. And we see here how faith is manifested in giving. Not withholding the thing. What do we know about Avraham and Yitzchak? Only one thing. That Avraham had loved him. Meaning they had a history of a loving father-son relationship. The commentators will tell you this is what Avraham has loved the most. But not more than God. He has waited. He had desired for this son. And now, this son of promise, everything was riding upon him, and God says, slay him. But because Avraham loved God above all, he was willing to do it. And it was this demonstration that God wanted to experience. God knew he would, but it shows that just knowing something and experiencing something are two different things. God wants to experience your obedience, not just that you have a heart that is bent towards obeying God, but he wants to experience your obedience. So he says, you know, now I know that you fear God, that you did not withhold your only son, your son, your only son, from me. Now, everything's changed. Avram was called to this place to offer up his son. Now he's being told by an angel not to do it. So what does he do? Look now to verse 13. And Avram lifted up his eyes. What's that? An idiom for prayer. And then it says, vayar, meaning, and he saw. Now, what do we know about this? It was through prayer that Avraham saw, meaning he received greater, new, fresh revelation. And it says, behold, always an important word, behold a ram behind, caught in the thicket with his horns. So there was a provision of a ram that was caught in the thicket. And this word thicket is where we get the word, you know, something that's uh, uh, confusing, something that is uh, hard to understand, very complicated. And he's caught with the horn. And what does that horn become? Well, this is the horn. And the reason why we read this passage on Rosh Hashanah, when we blow the trumpet or the Feast of Trumpets, is because this is the origin of the shofar, the ram's horn, this horn that was caught. And it speaks about God's provision. And we already learned God provides when he sees, he sees faithfulness. He sees the need of faithful people, that his will might be fulfilled. So in this passage of scripture, let's go back. It says, this, this lamb was caught in the thicket by his horns, and Avram went and he took the ram, and he offered it up as a burnt offering. Here's the key. Tachat beno, which means in the place of his son. So what do we have here? Well, we have a sacrificial, or I should say substitutionary sacrifice. We see that the ram died in place of Yitzchak because of the ram that was provided. And who provided it? God of himself, we've already saw. Avraham prophesied this. So because of the lamb that was provided of God, by God, of himself, and that expression is so important, we find that Yitzchak finds life. We could say the child, the promise, the promises of God finds life because of what God provided. 
And all of this looks towards the work of Messiah, who was a substitute for you and me. He died so that we could live, that we could find life. So he took the ram and he offered him up as a burnt offering in place of his son. Verse 14. And Avram called the name of the place. Here again, that is being repeated, is it not? Over and over. Hamakom, 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 the place. And it speaks about a manifestation of God's, God's presence with a person. So it's in this place of obedience, in this place of provision, in this place that God's being manifested, that, that Avraham, Avraham is experiencing God in a new way. So Avraham called the name of this place Hashem Yir A, which means God will see. And it's said of this place, in the mountain of the Lord, Yira A, which means it's passive. It's in the Hebrew, nif'al. What does that mean? Well, God will be seen, or it will be seen. What do we mean, it? A provision. It's in the mountain of God. What do we know about this mountain? What is it called? The Lord will teach. The Lord is my teacher. So it's when we obey that God will teach us. And it's through being taught by God that we are going to be in a spiritual condition that we can receive from God. God loves to provide. His nature is to bless. But there are spiritual laws that must be fulfilled and kept by you and me if this is going to be reality in our life. So this place, the Lord will be seen is one way we can translate it. The Lord in the mountain of the Lord, he will provide. And read on, verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Avram a second time from the heavens. Verse 16, and he said, I have sworn in myself, declares the Lord. So the angel Lord is speaking, but it's God who is conveying this message. For I have sworn in myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this thing, not that you just promised to do it, not just that you would say that you do it, not just that you wanted to do it, but because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, this is the third time, your only son. Now, it's to share with us that when we are willing to give what is most dear to us for the purposes of God, it demonstrates our fear of the Lord. That is that God is the priority of our life. And it positions us where we need to be to do greater things and move closer to the promises of God. So here again, what are you holding on to? What are you willing to, to offer up unto God in order that God would move in your life? It's an outcome of faithlessness when we hold on. God gives. What does the scripture say in the book of Romans? That God, he did not withhold his only begotten son, but rather he gave him to us or for us. And if that's the case, how much more also will he give to us with him everything? So God did not withhold back. Abraham didn't hold back. Don't you hold back. Live a sacrificial life. Be a giver. Be generous. And you know what? Let me tell you. When, when you are generous, and, and let me share with you, that, that one of the things, you look for, for places, individuals, that you can be generous to. And I'm not just talking about giving to ministries and such. But I'm talking about individually looking for people that have a need. Let me tell you something, and it's, it's, it's no sacrifice on my part. But literally today, I was sent on assignment by my wife to bring home pizza. And I went to this place, I ordered the pizza. I know the gentleman who runs that place because I'm a frequent client of his. Uh, I know that place, and I was talking to him, and this woman walked in. And it was obvious this was a woman who had very, very little. You could tell that by her condition, her clothes, everything about her scream, poverty. And she says, uh, I would really like something to eat. And how much is, and she ordered something or asked how much it was. And the gentleman says, 
30 shekels. And that's around $8. And she looks and she says, thank you. She turns around. And I said, are you short a little bit? And she said, and she opened up her hand and she had just a few agarot. Now, she knew she didn't have enough money, but she was hungry. So I said, what's eight bucks? I'll, I'll pay for it. Now, I did that, and I gave them money when I paid my bill, and the owner, he gave me back, instead of me paying 30 shekels, he only had me pay 15, and he put in, out of the pocket, 15 shekels. And what was his attitude? Now, I was still waiting for my pizza. She got her food. She left, and I said, I only paid half. He said, I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to give. So we split it. Now, this is what you should be looking for. Opportunities. Why? Opportunities to bless others. Sometimes in the simplest way. I mean, for most people, not all the people are listening, but for most people, giving two, three, four dollars to help someone else out that's hungry, clearly in need, is, is that really going to harm you? Is it going to cause you, I mean, if you don't eat, if you're like most individuals, missing a meal isn't going to hurt you one bit. So doing this, I mean, it was no sacrifice at all on my part or on his part. But we did this because we know God looks favorably when we look upon others to meet needs. And when we do that, it is the best form of spiritual insurance. Because, you know what? One day, maybe tomorrow, maybe later on today, maybe in a week or a year, I'm going to have some need. It may not be financial. But when you act in obedience, when God pricks your heart and says, help this person, do something, and you do it, God, what does the scripture say? That God is not unjust to forget the good deeds that we do in his name. And when we do so, and we find ourselves, God is going to raise up someone else. He's going to move. If there's no one there, God will do it supernaturally. He's going to take care of his people. What does David says? David says, I've been young and I've been old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken by God. So doing these acts of kindness, these things, and in this case, it was so simple. It didn't hurt. It wasn't a sacrifice for me or for him. It was just someone's hungry. Here's a few shekels. And when we act in obedience, it's in our best interest. We do it for the glory of God. But it's going to pay great dividends for the people who act in obedience. So be sensitive to others around you. Look, if you would, to verse verse. 15 again, and the angel Lord called to Abraham a second time from the heavens, and he said to him, I have sworn in myself, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and you have not withheld your son, your only begotten son. It says, for I will bless you. See what it says? I will bless you, and I will multiply your seed as. Now, he just did one thing. But notice that his seed's going to be as the stars of the heavens, as the, the, the sand which is upon the shore of the sea. And here's a very important term. Look at the end of verse 7. Vayirash zarecha et shar oivav, which means, and your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. What that means is this. That is a term of victory. Biblically speaking, when you possess the gate of your enemies, you've defeated them. So when we act in a giving way, when we don't hold on but we extend, when we live generously, it is position us so that we can have victory over our enemies. And enemies here is in the plural. Well, look now to verse 18. Now, I've taught on this not too long ago. You can go to our archive and see, see this. We don't have time to do it justice. But notice it says, And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. 
And this idea of being blessed has to do, it's a reflexive tense. It's the hit palel, which means because I do this, I will be blessed. It's reflex, reflexive. Very important that we see that. In English, it doesn't bring it out, only in Hebrew. So in your seed, well, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have heard my voice. Now, what's important is this word her, hearing is a word of response because you've heard and responded literally with my voice. Because you have acted, you have heard with my voice. It shows intimacy. That particle shows intimacy with God. Here again, none of the English can bring it out. It's impossible to bring it out in English, but the Hebrew has it. It reveals that obedience brings us close into intimacy with God. Finally, verse 19, And Avraham, he returned with his young men, and they rose up and they went together to Beersheba, and he dwelt, Avram dwelt in Beersheba. So all of this is to teach us the faithfulness of God. Well, I'm going to stop. We're going to pick up next week and conclude chapter 22 and move into the first part of chapter 23. Another important passage of scripture that reveals the faithfulness of God, his call upon his people, and the great rewards that come about because we hear, we respond for the glory of God. If that's your heart, that you obey because you want God to be glorified, then you can expect you to be moved closer and closer to becoming recipients of the promise of God. Well, may God bless you until we meet again next week and we conclude this 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, May the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.